Um, I'm doing this for Jason this morning. There's there's nothing. There's there's nothing. And there's nothing on my sleeves. Yeah. So we're in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We're going to start at the verse, um, at verse 23. This also marks one year, people. One year. One year ago, I stood up here and said, we're going through the gospel of of Mark. And it's been a year so far. And we're in chapter 10. And uh, I know some of you thought, no way. No, that's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. It might be August, September, now October before we get done with this. But we have sure learned a lot by walking through this gospel. And a lot about our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's been one year. Um, Just to back up a few weeks, so we get in context again is two weeks ago we talked about Jesus was picking up the children once they got through the disciples. He picked up the children and he blessed them. And he, and he gave that huge principle saying, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, then you have to have childlike faith. You have to put your hand in my hand just like a child puts its hand into its parents' hand and trusts and, it, it, for its safety and its guidance and direction in its life that you need to have that kind of faith. If you're going to enter the kingdom of God, you have to grab a hold of my hand. And then last week, we looked at just kind of like the opposite. Here is a rich young ruler. He's rich and he's young and he's a ruler. And he's got everything. He's got everything at his disposal. But he comes to Jesus realizing that there's still something missing. And when he gets to that point and says, what, 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 what's missing? Jesus says, well, there's one thing, one thing you lack. There's one thing that you haven't done, and that is, is that I'm not Lord of your life. And you need to set off all this stuff that is Lord of your life, and you have to take me by the hand. And we know the end of that story from last week, don't we? He didn't do it. He walked the other way, away from Jesus. So now, this passage of Scripture is right on the heels of, of that, of his disciples seeing that happen. And as we read through here, you're going to realize that this impacted them tremendously. This rocked them. They, they, they just couldn't believe what Jesus was saying and what they were seeing. So in verse 23, it says, And Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it is for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. It's hard for them to enter the kingdom of God. Why? Because they have so much resources. They have so many things, other things that they could rely on, that it's easy to rely on those things rather than on God. And if you think this morning that we're talking about somebody else this morning, we're not. Did you drive here this morning? Did you you use the bathroom that was inside your house this morning? Yeah. Did you eat this morning? Yeah. Yeah. When he talks about wealthy, he's talking about us. Even though you might point to somebody else who might be more wealthy than you. No, he's talking to us. We we have so many resources. And we have so many things in our lives where we can be dependent on those things rather than God. And he says when you depend, it's, it's hard for someone wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And look at his disciples in verse 24 says, The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Because here was the thought of the day. The thought of the day was, is that if someone was wealthy, if someone was rich, if someone had those resources, if someone had that position in life, well, man, for sure they're going to heaven. For sure. I mean, they have to be going to heaven because they have all all these resources to draw upon. And that's why they're astonished when he says, no. That's not the way a person enters into heaven, eternal life, the kingdom of God. He says, that's not how it works. And so he was tipping their their system completely upside down, as he's done in the past. So he says this phrase, verse 25, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, where does that come from? Everybody's glad Libby's here this morning. Woohoo! Where does that phrase come from? That phrase 
it comes from an old Persian phrase, and the Persians, when they would say it, was it's harder for it, it's it's like putting an elephant through the eye of a needle, okay? Which would be impossible, right? Well, they didn't have elephants in Israel, so they picked their biggest animal. And what was their biggest animal? Camel. Now, I know a lot of people try to downplay this verse, and they try to soften it up and say, well, there was a little tiny gate in the wall, and if you wanted to get a camel through, then you had to take everything off the camel and get it down on its knees and push it through. But you could get it through, but that's how you do it. Well, there's, there's no such gate. <laughs> and any sensible camel driver would have just went around the corner and got in the big gate, okay, rather than doing that to the camel. There's another thought, is that there's one letter changed from, in the Greek from the word camel and the word rope. And so when they were translating this, they, they, they just got that wrong letter in there, and it should have said rope, but the word for rope means cable. It means huge rope. So even in that, it's like, well, man, how would you get that through the eye of a needle? And then put on top of that, that it would have had to have been wrong also in Mark, Matthew's gospel and also wrong in Luke's gospel. So all three of them would have had to get that wrong letter in there to make it work. But it wasn't that. What Jesus was saying was using this saying from Persia, saying it's impossible for this to happen. Watch how his disciples respond. Verse 26. And they were even more astonished and said to them, then how can we, then who can be saved? I mean, they, they looked at it and it wasn't a cable and it wasn't a little, little gate. They, they were literally taking what he was saying and saying, wait a minute here. Who can be saved? If the rich man can't be saved with all the resources and everything that he has, if he can't be saved, who can be saved? Now, I want to stop there and say, what is our context of this passage? He's talking about salvation. That's the context of the passage. Now, look at verse 26, or 27. Looking at them, Jesus said, with people, it is impossible. What's impossible? <laughs> to be saved. In the context of the passage, it's impossible for you to save yourself, or you to do anything to save yourself or to have any type of resources or outside resources to save yourself. It is with people, it is impossible, but not with God for all things are possible with God. What are the all things he's talking about? He's talking about salvation. I know that we throw that phrase around on a whole bunch of things, but when you quote it, you need to quote it in context of what he's talking about. Here. He's talking about salvation, the only way that we are saved is through God. He's the only one who can save us. It's interesting where we see that, that phrase. And if you have your Bibles, you can flip over to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 34. We're going to see that phrase again. And it's going to be used in a similar type of context. So Luke chapter 1, starting at verse 34. Now this is, this is the Christmas story. And Gabriel is, has come to meet with Mary to tell Mary of what is going to happen. And so he's, he's told her that she's going to be with child. And Mary responds in verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? I mean, I've never been with a man. I, I, this is not physically possible for what you're saying to me to happen, to happen. And then he says back in 35, um, yeah, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has, has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. Something impossible for her to have happen, it's happened to her. For, and then it says, For nothing will be impossible with God. This thing that's going to happen to you, Mary, or, yeah, to Mary, this, this physical birth that's going to happen to you, it's only going to be able to happen to you because of God. There's no way man could have orchestrated this, done this in any way, shape, or possible. It's only possible because it's, because it's of God. 
that God caused this physical birth to happen. And now we see that phrase used again back in Mark saying, okay, not a physical birth, but there's a spiritual birth that needs to happen. And the only way the spiritual birth happens is because of God. There is no other way for it to happen. So we go on in the passage. I'm back in Mark again. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Peter began to say to him, because Peter always says, has something to say, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. So he's confused about this whole conversation and going, but wait a minute, Jesus. We, we have done what you asked the rich young ruler to do. And he walked away. He didn't take your hand. He walked the other way. But we didn't do that. We have done that. We've done exactly what you said. We have left everything. We've put our hand in yours. We've put our trust in you. We, wherever you go, that's where we're going. Wherever you sleep, that's where we sleep kind of thing. And so he's really confused now. He's like, okay, if the rich can't get into heaven, who can get into heaven? And he's saying it's impossible other than with God. What about us? Verse, the next verse, verse 29 Jesus said, truly, and you know that word now, don't you? Truly. Anytime he says truly, tremendous, huge truth that's coming next. Truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or farms for my sake and for the gospel's sake. So the reason that you have left, the reason that you are fo- is because you are following him and him alone. Verse 30 but that he will receive a hundred times as much now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and farms. He's, he's going to give three things here. If you put your hand in his hand, he's going to give you three things in this passage right here. The first thing is, is you've recognized that you have left all those to put him first in your life, and what will you receive? You'll receive even a greater family. Because sometimes we accept Jesus Christ and our families go in the other direction. He says, but if you accept Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you a bigger family. I'm going to give you the family of God. You're going to have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and houses and lands. You are going to have all the resources of being a part of the family of God. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. I have. I've experienced the love of, of the family of God that is, has well surpassed the love even of my own physical family at times. And you have to get a grip on that, that what he's saying to you is even if you're walking in a total direction than what maybe the majority of your family is, that he has planted you into a family of God who are your brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and houses and lands and all the resources that is within this body of Christ is now in your possession. Because we are to what? Love one another. Care for one another. Be kind to one another. All those things are at your fingertips. That's the one, first thing you get. The second thing, which we don't like, he says, here's the second thing you get. Along with persecutions. <laughs> yeah. He, he sandwiches that baby right in there. He says, along with persecutions. You know, if you put your hand in my hand, there, you will suffer. You will go through things because you are associated with me. And all you have to do is look there. That's all you have to do. And go that, you know, if I stand for Christ and I go Christ's direction, uh, there will be times when I'm going the opposite direction than everybody else is going. And there will be times when I do things differently than other people do and say things differently than other thing people say. And, and sometimes it will hurt, and sometimes it will be a, a, a persecution upon us. But, but it's worth putting your hand in his hand, because he gives you a third thing. It's all like a sandwich here. And in the age to come, eternal life. It says, if you put your hand in my hand, I'm going to give you eternal life. And I love how he does that. He kind of sandwiches it. He tells you first off, he says, you're going to have a greater family and all the family of God, is good. you're going to be a part of that and all the resources is that there and they're going to serve you and they're going to love you and care for you and everything else. And then you are going to have persecutions in there. But on the other side, think about it too. You, you get all of eternal life and when you realize it. So you, you lean this way, when, even if there are persecutions, you lean this way onto the family of God 
knowing that they're going to give you support and they're going to say, keep following the faith and following the word of God and everything while that's going. And, it, and when persecutions are happening, you lean this way and, and go, you know what? This is not my home. I'm just here for a short time. I got a heavenly home. He's building a room for me. I'm going to see him someday. I'm going to see him face to face. It's, I'm just here for a little time. You see how he sandwiches that together? Then he says, verse 31, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. And Mark ends it right there. He gives this little phrase that Jesus gives, and he doesn't give explanation to it. Actually, Matthew is the only one who does this. So if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 20. Because there's a parable that Jesus gives after he says those words. And it's a parable that his disciples need to hear. Because his disciples think that if somebody's rich and got resources, for sure they're going to go into heaven. And he's flipping that over. They need to be readjusted about what they think of about when they think of salvation. So Matthew chapter 20, and actually if you look at chapter 19, verse 30, the last verse, it says, but many who are first are last and the last will be first. And then he goes into this parable. And he's going to explain what he means by that. And I love this parable. I am so thankful I get to teach this. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Who would be the landowner? Who owns it all? God does. He goes out into his vine- he goes out and he's calling out people to work in his vineyard. He's calling them out to work in his vineyard. Now I'm going to call on people this morning. So um, let's see. Let's get Mary Hansen and Josh right here. You, you guys come on up because it says in verse 2, when he had agreed with the labors for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. So the work day is 12 hours long. That's like a long time, 12 hours. And Mary's out of bed at 6 a.m. in the morning because that's when the day starts. <laughs> and he comes up and he says, okay, I'll, I'll offer you a denarius a day to work in my vineyard for 12 hours, okay? A denarius is the going wage so he's not offering you something less than what you should receive or anything like that. This is, this is the going rate. And so you both agree. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, that's what I need to see. Okay, stay right there. Okay, next verse. And he went out at the third hour and saw others standing in the marketplace. And, in, and to those, he said, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. So he goes back out, and he says, I need some more workers. So Rachel and Bethany, you come here. Now it's three hours later, so that's 6 a.m., so now this is 9 a.m. And notice that he doesn't say to you, I'm going to give you a denarius, does he? He says, whatever's right, I'm going to give to you. Okay? And so you take him at his word and say, Okay, okay, so you're 9 o'clock. Why don't you move over a little bit so there's a little separation between you there, yeah. Then, watch the passage. Again, he went out, I'm in verse 5. Again, he went out at the 6th and the ninth hour and did the same thing. So the 6th hour would have been noon. So um, let's take Jason and Linda, come on up. You're the noon people right here. He said the same thing to you. I'll, I'll pay you whatever's right. Go out in my vineyard. So you're the noon people. Okay. Oh, who else? Who wants to be in on this? Um, Brian, Brian and Jamie, come on up. You'll be the you'll be the three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. You're the three o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Then it goes on. He's not done. He says about the eleventh hour. Now, the 11th hour of a 12-hour day starting at 6 a.m. would be when? 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 5 o'clock, so there's only one hour left. About the 11th hour, he went out and he found others standing around and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? 
Why are you just standing here idle all day? And they said, because no one has hired us. No one has called out to us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Now notice on this one, he doesn't say, he doesn't say you know, I'll pay you whatever you need, whatever, you know, whatever's right or anything like that. He just says, man, get in the vineyard. Just get in the vineyard. So you two, you're Angie and Savannah, you're the five o'clockers. You're right here. Get in the vineyard. Now, here's where it really comes alive. You see, the, you see it? Six, nine, noon, three, and five. Verse eight. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman. Now, usually the foreman of the owner was his son. He's most likely his son. And his son had that position because of who he was to the father. And he said to the foreman, he says, I want you to give out the wages. I want you to pay, give payment to these workers. So Ben, you're the foreman. Yeah, you stand right here, like face, face this way, okay? Foreman, foreman Ben. <laughs> Well, we, we know he has all the money, so this, this is going to work out. He says, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. Okay? And so when those hired about the 11th hour, 5 o'clock, came, each one received a denarius. So, give them a denarius. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And then move right here. You're moving down the line right there. Okay. Now, did you see what happened down there? One hour of work. Same pay. Same pay. But wait a minute. Maybe he said that wrong. I doubt it. If you do the math right, what, what, what would be happening here? For one, one hour of work, you got a denarius. How, are, how many hours have you been working? Twelve. Twelve. So it could be 12, 12 denarius. denarius. Oh, you want to call Kenny about this? No. <laughs> so, tell, tell, oh, yeah, maybe you don't want him to know. Yeah, maybe you don't want him to know. Yeah. But your hopes are getting like, hmm, hmm. So when um, those are hired the 11th hour, verse 10, when those hired first came, they thought they would, when those hired first came, they thought they would what? Receive more. But each one received a denarius. So you play this out, Ben. Pay them a denarius. Pay them a denarius. Pay them a denarius. <laughs> okay, you think you're getting more. You think you're getting more. But, and... And this is what they thought, because the story says, when they received, they grumbled. Grumble. Okay. At the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the scorching heat of the day. But he, the landowner, said to one of them, he said to one of them, I'm assuming it's yes, you. No. no. <laughs> You won't even tell Kenny what you're getting. I, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Do you not agree with me? Did you not agree with me for one denarius? Wasn't that the agreement 12 hours ago? Take what is yours and go. But if I wish to give this to the last man the same as you, is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? And then he says, so the last shall be first and the first last. Now let me play this out a little bit farther. See, because they had to get readjusted on what it meant to be saved and what salvation meant. They thought they could earn their salvation. They thought maybe they were better than others in their salvation. And Jesus had to stop that thought and say, wait, I'm going to give you this little story and I'm going to show you that salvation <laughs> is the same. And it's really, you really should be thankful that it's all the same. Because watch, Ben, go back down there, foreman. 
See, these, these people represent a lot of us, okay? We came to faith when we were five or ten, and we've been in the church our whole lives, and we've been serving him and, and, and everything. A lot of us are, are here. Some of us are here. We, we got saved when we were teenagers. We were young adults, and, and, and um, something, we, we went to college or some event, and, and it you know, hit us then. And some of us are here in our life where it's, you know, okay, we got kids and, and, and all that kind of stuff is factoring in and we realize, well, we should be, you know, more serious about our, our walk with God and we make a, our way back to the church. And some of us are here, you know, midlife. I'm sorry, I put you at midlife there. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, and so you're, you're reevaluating where you're at and everything. And, and so you're searching and, and, you know, and God really calls out to you at that. And then there's some that are like, ooh, you guys are, I mean, end of life, you know. It's just, just like, I mean, there's not much time left. And, 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 and it's almost like, man, you better get in now or, or you don't have any time. Now, why we need to have this change is because, Angie, you come with me down here. And you take Mary's spot down there. And Mary, you come on up here. You stand by Savannah. See, this is why we need to change. It's because this is where you could be. That's right. This is where you could be. And aren't you thankful that that landowner doesn't work on any of our merit? That it doesn't matter when he calls you? And that you get salvation. Mm-hmm. You don't get partial salvation. You, didn't get, you don't get, you know, like part eternal life. <laughs> you know, Amen. that you had this opportunity. And so we really need to have this. They needed this adjustment to say that, you know what? Everybody along this line is what? Saved. Yeah, they're all the same. Saved. And we need that adjustment in our lives. You guys can sit down. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank you, Mary, especially. <sighs> we need to, you know, his disciples needed to see that analogy played out for them. To realize that the, the last, the last ones called... The last ones who called nearest to their time of eternal life and being with him shall be first. And the first who have been with him a long time and called a long time and walking with him all the way shall be, shall be last. But where do they end up? They all end up at the same place. Because of what? Salvation. Not anything else. Salvation. And that salvation only comes... By God. There is no way for us to earn it in any way, shape, or form. It's all because of Him. Any time that we think we're better than someone else because we're farther down on the list, uh, we need an adjustment. We need an adjustment to realize that salvation... And you know what? If we really travel along that thought pattern that I'm better than somebody else, um, most likely you're not going to witness to that person. Most likely, you're not going to tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ if you think that you're better than someone else in this, in this avenue. No, you, you need to realize that you could be anywhere on the line. Anywhere on the line. And when Jesus calls you and saves you, you are saved. And you have a heavenly home. You have a tremendous family that you've inherited. You will have sufferings because you're following Christ. But you have an eternal home to be with him. The song that we're going to sing in closing this morning um, is my song. Not my song. I was 11 years old on a Thursday night, Turner, Michigan. There was an evangelist named Lane Loman, and he gave the message. This was the third week of messages. I finally sunk into my head. And he said, uh, is there anybody here tonight that would like to surrender all to Christ? Did I have any idea what surrender all meant at that time? Probably not. Because I've been continuing to surrender over my life to Him. Especially when I, when I think I'm better than other people. Especially when I, when I get off, I, I need to surrender again to Him. 
And so this morning, we're just going to sing the song as a closing hymn, I Surrender All, I Surrender All to Thee, My Precious Savior, I Surrender All. It's 408 in the hymnal. Would you stand with us, please?